Well, I have a few objectives for us in the next half hour, and, and then Lorraine will take over with her pr presentation. Um, I want to gain a basic understanding of the concept of service learning. And uh, the, the, I want to say off, offhand right now, this is going to be kind of a casual look at this. We're not going to deep delve deeply into the academic research and rigor of service learning, but rather, I hope that, especially uh, judging from the audience that we have here, I, I hope that we can walk away with some applicable things you can take and, and put into use in your family room or your classroom to engage your students and your children in the process of learning through service. So that's one of our things we'll talk about today. Um, as, as mentioned, my journey so far, uh, I'm a son of an educator, a high school teacher for years. My father is now on a, a school board. It's just in the blood. And so I knew I was going to go into education, but it was on my mission that I had decided on elementary ed. I was in an area in Washington, in the Washington Spokane Mission, and uh, one of the teachers in, in the schools that we were serving in, we would go in and read and play at recess and things, um, noted that there are so many children just flocking around my companion and me. And she said, that's because they don't have men in their lives. And I thought, I know what I want to do. I want to be a male role model for these kids. They don't, they're single family homes and all kinds of things going on. And so I changed my emphasis, <coughs> excuse me, and became an elementary education major, me and 300 women here at BYU. <laughs> And there were a few other guys, but, but we, we forged through, got our degree, and uh, I jumped right into uh, a, a position in California in elementary education in fourth grade. I literally had a box of, of books from my course, my major, and uh, walked in, and that's it. And it was starting from scratch. My sweet wife came in and decorated the walls, and we jumped in. But I, read, I immediately noticed as I began to teach the need for these students, one, to become engaged, and two, to do so in a way that is meaningful, some, something that will really change their lives. And so we started to, to look around our neighborhoods. And when we would do writing projects, we would look at ways that we could incorporate uh, maybe a, a gift card to a local hospital. Or maybe we could find some way to clean up the local cemetery and start to steer these students to look at their community. And that started to become a theme for, for each year of instruction. I, I taught third, fourth, and fifth grades. Uh, eventually, uh, I was challenged to cowboy up and, and look at the dark side of administration. It became a light side for me. I enjoyed it, surprisingly. Uh, and, and I spent three years as an administrator in which we were able to have a broader in, influence on, on the larger group of students. And, and I really enjoyed that capacity. Um, in, in that area, again, service became something that I just kept feeling drawn to. And then uh, this opportunity here at BYU just opened up in 2014. I came in and, and became the director of the Center for Service and Learning. And that, that, that kind of second career has become such a, a great blessing because I've been able to see the blessings that, uh, that come as we achieve the, uh, the gifts. We, we discover and put into action the gifts that we have. Um, and, and so that's what I want to talk about today, is employing those, those gifts in the educational process. I so wish you could see my awesome slides. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I took a lot of instruction uh, over the last five years from this model, this, this uh, book here called Learning Through Serving, and it's a student guidebook for service learning. I would recommend it as a very basic uh, introduction to the idea of, of more formally um, introducing service into your instruction. A student guidebook for service learning across the disciplines. It's by Kress, Collier, and Reitenauer and Associates. So we'll have that up here. Um, but basically, it, it, it gives us an introduction to just what is uh, service learning. And we can talk about that as an engagement of students in some kind of learning while processing through service, while, while reaching out to others around them. Um, the purpose being clearly that we would identify the needs of those around us and see how we can tie that in curricularly with um, the standards that need to be taught. And it's interesting as students dig into the opportunities that do lie around them in their community, they start to notice that, um, well, we, we talk about the the education being a place where we can, we can access multiple disciplines, um, multiple intelligences, right? And so suddenly, 
as we're teaching, we're not only just teaching this language art standard or this science standard, but rather we can combine them all as we begin to uh, access these community engagement opportunities. In my class here, I teach at BYU. It's called Student Development 290. Um, we have a series of um, lessons that go through helping the students access their gifts. What do they have that helps them to be able to reach out and, and, uh, and bless those around them? And so, oh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong one. I apologize. I had this all set up. Okay, we're making progress, folks. Um, let, me, let me just back up a couple things here. So the objectives. This is my, my, these are my people. Um, and I have this up here just because I want you to understand how important um, the family is. This is the laboratory for learning in service. This is where it starts. We, as children, were taught by our own parents how to serve in this capacity um, by watching the modeling of our parents and, and constantly caring for us. So there are my six boys, my two girls. You can see the little ones were not hardly affected at all by being the only daughters. Um, they're just fine. Don't worry about them. But I, I really love these people, and they are what I do everything for, right? And this is, you can connect it to the family proclamation. It's all centered around the family for me. This is where service is learned. And I hope that we can share that with those that we teach as well, that they really look back home for their lessons in service and, and, and recognize the, uh, the blessings that have been theirs through the people whom they love. So here at BYU then, as I was mentioning, we'll go back a little bit. In 2014, I took the director position at the Center for Service and Learning. We have 70 community service programs created and operated by students. And so really my job is to encourage and mentor and clap and cheer and, and uh, help organize and maintain budgets and all that boring stuff, yes, but really work with these students to help them have that experience in the field. At BYU, we don't so much have a, a, a giant correlated service learning initiative. More or less, the professors are kind of, uh, they kind of do it on their own and uh, look for those opportunities in the community. We seek to support that by having this center full of opportunity. Um, we have had 21,000 students attend service-oriented activities within YSERV over the last year, and uh, about 80,000 hours of volunteer service, which is millions of dollars economically that benefit our community here in Utah County. Um, and, and you can see, too, that the education and mentoring is the largest category. We constantly have students reaching out in that area, but we also work with Habitat for Humanity, Boys and Girls Club, lots of hands-on opportunities. And the neat thing that I'm very proud of is that in our annual program surveys, 88.2% was our last effort from 2018, of our respondents continue to serve. We're going for persistence here. They continue to serve even beyond Brigham Young University. So that's, that's what we want is that lasting impact. And for your students, you want to, to plant that seed and let it continue to grow. By definition from this book I was sharing, the service learning definition is students engaging in community service activities, and I love this, with intentional academic and learning goals. So we're designing these activities to serve by tying them into the core curriculum standards or whatever our per personal educational objectives are for that lesson, and give them opportunities, this is uh, crucial as well, to have reflection. It's, it's critical that they take time to, to reflect, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes to their academic disciplines. And so let's notice, many times we will stand up in front of a group of students, and this could be children, this could be full-grown adults, but we naturally are focused on ourselves. I teach here at BYU, college-age kids are very, very focused here, and they kind of need to be. Mom and Dad aren't right there. And so um, this is a time when they're very, very, very self-focused. My major, my job, my relationships, my future, what we want to do is try and get that to a broader vision of that which is around them. And so um, 
I have a very good example of this in, we have a student named Caroline Hansen, and she is a, she was a program director here at BYU years ago when I first got hired. Um, went on to teach English at Salem Junior High School, and um, she had, when she was here, the position of program director of our program called Access, which is a big brother, big sister program. And she got a little girl named Hope, who was four years old at the time. And she continues even today to keep contact with Hope. I checked up with her when I, when I uh, talked to her in her classroom. Um, and she also shared with me that she's using the principles that she learned here in the classroom. So here she is in a public seventh grade classroom teaching English and came up with this idea to have a multidisciplinary unit related to a text they read called The Giver. I think many of us have probably read it or our children have at some point by Lois Lowry. A dystopian society, there's no emotion, uh, kind of negative. And, and so she thought she could take the principles that were in that book and rather teach the value of empathy for others and compassion. And so she combined it with a uh, lesson on community service. However, notice she also pulled out language arts standards and social science standards and, and really designed this beautiful unit um, by challenging the students in small groups to create an infographic brochure. So they had this end product that they were going to produce. And they would demonstrate that through, with that brochure a way they could make a difference in their community. And uh, while she did that, she invited myself, as well as another woman who works in a nonprofit in the Valley, to come and speak on different days to them. So she, she incorporated the community there, bringing guest speakers in. And I have to say, with my class, Student Development 290, I always bring in a guest speaker. It just really helps. It piques their interest. They, they're, they're listening to an expert on a certain topic. And um, I don't know how to feel about this, but they're in my class reviews, they always say the guest speaker was just top notch, you know, so um, he does a great job in, in really initiating some thought in a different way than I would to the audience. So I, I, I'm uh, very, very much in favor of using that tool in the classroom. Uh, although not required, some students actually carried out their projects in the end, which is really cool. They created these little brochures um, for, uh, one of them did a pet, um, it was a, a kind of a dog walking business that they wanted to do for money once upon a time, and then this lesson made, made them change it to, I'm gonna do this for service, and I'm gonna start reaching out. And then they started visiting with the owners of the dogs, often they were elderly folks in their neighborhood, and started to create relationships. So you can see how this diverges into so many blessings and, and opportunities for the students. Another one uh, reached out to a community cleanup organization and then they started, these kids in the neighborhood started doing a weekly um, walk through the neighborhood with trash cans, trash bags. And they just set that example for everyone in the community of cleaning up. And that was a direct result of this idea that the teacher had to, to incorporate service into a language arts based activity. So I, I really like this as a, a general case study. Um, in the classroom, we also like to use a, a lot of videos to help. And I want to see if we can just play a quick commercial because I want you to see the flow of, of um, thought process that you can develop in, in, according to the, 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 oops, sorry. Struggling with my technology. Prayers work. Sir, I have to say that 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 I I hate this country. What do you want to do? I want 
जाने बूंदे आए जाने कैसा दर्द लाई सामने क्या है ये तेरे क्यों रुका है तू बता दे को पार लेगा कौन होगा वो मसीहा मुझ से तू ढूंढता है वो ही है तू तू वही है तुझ में तेरा रास्ता है तुझ में तेरा है सहारा तू ही तुझ को पार लेगा तू ही है तेरा किनारा Eventually, it looks like India is looking for leadership too. But you can see the point being, we can pull a lot of information from this one slide, uh, or I'm sorry, video clip. And so, take the time then. You find some media you like. I, I, I like to use this one because we can start to incite some great conversation around the tree video and what what happened. What did they do, right? What, what did this little boy? do and so we pull out some principles of service and you start to talk to your students they come up with things you'll never even think of but in this video we have a, an institution versus community element where i don't know if you noticed but those in uniform representing maybe the government of the institution were kind of just hanging out waiting for something to, to be solved here where the grassroots community members got up did something about the problem right and so what we're trying to do recognize this is we're trying to pull from our students their observational skills of what can be done to lift the burdens of others in their community. And you start to get this conversation going in your classroom of um, what, what do they observe? We have this, this great talk, observe then serve, right? Um, you can pull that one in as well if you're doing an LDS environment. Um, but the power of one was illustrated. I like to call it the steak dance principle. Someone has got to get the party started, right? And this little boy had that thought. Whether or not he was going to move the tree didn't matter. He went out and gave the effort, and it automatically drew uh, others to, to that effort. I don't know if that was your experience at steak dances as a youth, but that was mine. Some crazy girl would get out there in the middle, and suddenly everybody was good. The courage of youth. Service being contagious. Everyone wants to jump in. It's satisfying. I love this, this uh, screenshot. Like, look at his face. He just feels accomplishment at pulling this out. And that's what you see in your students when they decide to engage in an idea they came up with, and that's critical, that they come up with the idea and then they go and pull it through. You as a coach can kind of help to, to guide their, their efforts um, and, and, and kind of help them think through some of the dynamics that are involved with their project. That's your job as a service learning coach. But let them be in charge. I think that's so critical. Um, observe and serve was another one, as we mentioned. Pointers versus scoopers was just an allusion to a book we read um, talking about those who can take initiative in their community. So anyway, some, some great things to look at just from media. Find some, some commercials and you'll start to see uh, some great things that you can apply that are engaging for the students. They love to see media, right, in, in the presentations. Um, it, as I mentioned, it's, it's important to identify the gifts that each of us has. Our Heavenly Father sent each of us down with spiritual gifts. Elder Clark uh, kind of talked about that this morning. And we have this, this doctrine before us. But one kind of thing I try to teach our students, and, and you can uh, in, adopt this to how you will with yours, um, but when we are recognizing the gifts we have and offering those assets to others, Sometimes it's awkward. It feels a little bit strange, like we're bragging about ourselves. And I hope that our students recognize that when we're doing that, we're not necessarily bragging about ourselves, but rather the God that gave us those gifts. 
And suddenly, when you, when you realize that, you all of a sudden have this willingness to try now and to, to, to open it up. And, and instead of bragging, you're praising God. So that's an important thing to, to recognize. <coughs> I'm sorry. In uh, the missionary training center, I remember feeling very homesick about three days in. I remember feeling like, uh, I don't know why I'm out here. What, what is this all about? And, and just kind of very self-centered in this zone. And uh, I did what, what I've been trained to do, get on my knees. And that helped. But I knew there was something more. And I crawled over to the desk and opened up my scriptures. And when I did that, it unlocked this scripture for me that changed everything. And I, can, I was trying that experiment of just let's open and see what comes. And I did that, and I, you know, fortunately, I, I landed on Mosiah chapter 4. And that's King Benjamin's address, all about service, frankly. But my eyes fell upon verse 21. And now if God, who has granted you all these blessings, right, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, he's, he's given you this, he's given you that, he's given you faith, he's given you talents and skills and gifts. Oh, then, how you ought to impart of the substance you have one to another is how that verse ends. And that's the statement that really drove home to me. And I thought, what do I have to impart? What did God give me? Finally, I took some time to open up my journal and just list the many blessings God has given me. With your students, it's critical that you help them to recognize what they have in their toolbox. What did God give them? If you're in a public school classroom, what are your talents? Right? And let's recognize them. It's also critical that you go beyond that step, pause and reflect on the gifts God has given you. Look at the next one. Ask others what gifts they see in you. Very insightful, very cool. Um, I'm a words of affirmation guy. I love that. Tell me all, you know. But it's very helpful to know because they will mention things you don't even recognize in yourself. And your students will begin to see that they have additional capacity that they didn't yet recognize. Using the list of gifts you and others have identified, write a personal service mission statement. How will I go about using these gifts and talents that I've been blessed with? What will I do? It, I have this vision that we're all unique puzzle pieces in this grand puzzle. It's a beautiful puzzle, right? But what part do we play? What color is our, what shape is our piece? And, and how will we contribute to those around us? These are the things we want to draw out of our students through that exercise. I've had them draw a sphere of influence. So we've got these concentric circles, right? And this is to recognize just who we can reach out to. Now we've, we've got the what. Now we can focus on the who. Make a drawing of your own like this, including specific names of people in your life. So we start with me and then go broader. This is, this is mine, my spouse, my children, our extended family. And you get bigger and bigger, and you're looking at the world eventually. Um, but this helps the students, and I, I hope they put specific names in there. This helps them to recognize their, their greatest spheres of influence. And it, it's interesting that closest to them will be, the, the names in those circles will be family members. They will be neighbors and best friends. And, and, and then, you know, they could include the lady that works in the cafeteria and the janitor and, and all these, the school secretary in this, this uh, concentric circle and start to recognize now these names as they go about their day. We ask them to observe and serve. We ask them to use their senses. So then they see that janitor, and that, that little thought comes to their mind. What can I do to lift his burden? How can I help? Right? And having that mindset changes everything in your lessons in the classroom, because as you continue to introduce new content, they will start to have this mindset of, well, how does that affect me, and how can I use my gifts to bless my community. Um, if you are an elementary teacher, here's a couple ideas. Um, create cards for veterans in local retirement homes. Very easy. Create seasonal decorations. Um, both of those can be done so quickly and so easily, but it starts to get the students away from their own mindset and thinking about others. And if possible, it would be even better to have a field trip where you can go deliver those. That's where the, the real cream is, to be able to talk to these people. We have a program here at BYU called Utah Healing Arts. It's a live serve program where the students get together and sing or play violin or harmonic or whatever in these local retirement homes. But the real service happens when they put down the instruments and go and sit down next to Herbert and Ethel, and, and they have these conversations. And inevitably, 
the elderly will, will share something with the college student that they just needed to hear that day. It always happens. And we call that in the biz mutual reciprocity, right? Where both are being served and neither knows who's serving whom. That's a beautiful moment. Uh, that's what we're striving for in our service. So that's what I mentioned on the bottom there. Be sure to visit with those you're serving. Add that personal touch. Um, it's important to look at resources in your community. United Way is a great resource. They've got service opportunities. They've got Eagle Scout projects, right? Um, lots of programs for your local communities, wherever you are. Of course, we would mention JustServe.org, which is a, a bulletin board of service. I hope everyone in this room has, has been there and has registered on it. It's always interesting to see what's available. I, I just looked recently, and there were about 90... 94 opportunities within five miles of this room um, right now where there is need in the community. And so, uh, and a lot of those are even hands-on. There was, I was surprised to see there were so many that you literally could take into a classroom and make kits for refugees or, or educational kits or, or things like that. Days for Girls is always on there. Um, there's so many good things right here in your neighborhood. JustServe.org also organizes them by location by dates, by categories, and so there's lots of ways to, to look at this. I hope you take a, a glance at that if you haven't yet. Another great resource, BYU TV is a great place of inf inspiration for me. I don't work for them, I work with them, right? But Random Acts and Turning Point are two programs on there that you can look up and get tons of ideas. I love Turning Point, they've got like 66 different episodes of people who've made a difference in their community. And they're all appropriate to uh, show clips of in your, in your classroom as well, to get these ideas generated. Now, Random Acts, they may have seen, it's a much more kind of upbeat, funny kind of programming. But again, showing good to the community and people just doing it grassroots, making things happen um, from, from evidently nothing, right? And, and so that's what we're hoping our students start to look at as they, as they go around in their work. Uh, here's another clip just showing good service and bad service. Um, I, I'm not going to take the time, but I'll tell you, this is a very effective way to talk about things that don't work, right? In this commercial, what appears to be an old man jogging and stretching out, uh, that's actually what it is. The gentleman on the right sees him as he's driving in his car and thinks, I know what I could do to help that man, and they push the car off the cliff. And that's absolutely not what the, the person needed, right? And there's so many times where we reach out to help in service, and it's, we're doing the, the thing that is not needed. And that's something that I think that's important to recognize, teaching our students that it's, 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 it may, there may be some things that are not helpful to people. And how can we avoid those? And I think the obvious answer is get to know them. We've, we need to know and understand and love those we serve. And as we do that, we will be impressed to know exactly what they need. Um, I talked to my father. I, t I mentioned he was a, a high school teacher. And for years, he taught an AP psych class at Elsinore High School. And he talked about this, uh, this old movie that BYU created way back, Johnny Lingo. And so he, he's shown this to thousands of kids in public school. The eight cow principle, right? Loving and serving another can help one perceive themselves in a better light. And what he would do is he created this kind of economy of mind called cowage. Well, how many cows is this worth or whatever, right? And so this cowage project included students would be being asked to do something of service for someone that was unexpected and possibly undeserved. And to do it only for the purpose of service. No retribution, no recompense, right? They were to repeat this on a daily basis and evaluate and reflect upon how their service affected the relationship. He told the story of one girl who um, had a terrible relationship with her, um, her stepdad and just, just frankly hated him. And suddenly, in a tragic accident, her mom passed away. She was injured. She really literally had nothing but stepdad now as far as family. And she, she did this project. And she just made stepdad her focus and served him and lifted him and built him. And suddenly, everything flipped on it. And, and kind of like Elder Clark talked about with the forgiveness thing this morning, suddenly all of that was gone, and she just had nothing but love for him because of the service that she rendered toward him. So, just checking here. Um, 
Secondary ed, coordinate with special needs classes, a peer mentoring arrangement, obviously reach out and see what you can do. They, they, the, what you're seeing here is a photo of a prom that was put on by the students of his class. They reached out to the special needs class on campus and, and created relationships. And through the years, those kids would wave at each other. They'd do things together outside of school. Um, you know, this is the, the, the fancy jock or, you know, popular kid hanging out with the, the individual with Down syndrome or something like this. And what a difference that made for his class. Building empathy, building love, building compassion. Uh, and so they, they have the special needs prom. And I thought that was a, a great example. Higher ed, I talked about the Student Development 290 class. Okay, and uh, finding ties with community needs, curricular objectives, from partnerships with local community partners and see what you can do. What are their needs? And I would, I would emphasize that. Find out their needs first before you design your projects because you want to meet a real need. That makes the difference. Um, include reflection activities throughout the process. Some of you may have heard of Rosebud and Thorn or Wagon Wheel. Um, and I'll take a second just to talk about that. Rose is something beautiful, something awesome. Bud is something that you're developing a knowledge for, you're starting to understand, and Thorn is something you really don't get, you're, you're struggling with it. You can see, I hope, in your circumstances how you can apply that in so many ways. We've even done it at home around the dinner table just about our day with the kids. Wagon wheel, you take uh, a group, split them into groups of three, and uh, um, so each is numbered one, two, or three, and then uh, the ones will stay, the twos go left, the threes go right, and Basically, you split them up so you get this really heterogeneous grouping going on, and then you're able to give them some reflection questions about the activity they did. What did you learn? What came from this? What new capacity did you develop? You know, and they discuss that in small groups, and a lot of good reflection takes place. In addition to, and I, I keep talking about this reflection, the whole point of education is to turn mirrors into windows, to be able to not focus on here, but focus on others and build and lift our communities. That reflection piece is vital in helping us to really understand what we are learning. It can be done in multiple ways with journaling, conversation, uh, creating, a lot of art. In my class, we've had people do rap. We've had, you know, I brought some examples of visual art and storybooks and uh, beautiful ways that people represent what has been learned by a new concept. But that's essential following your service. And so there's where I want to kind of leave you with just piquing your interest in how this applies to your situations in your classrooms and your family rooms. I hope that you can reach out and find ways to touch the hearts of those that you teach, as the Savior has done for us. Uh, and I say this in his name, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Okay, there's a handout coming, coming around. Um, so you can take notes and kind of think ahead and through some things as we're, as we're rearranging. I want you to think about, we heard, we heard just in general conference from President Nelson last October about unleashing the power of families. And he was talking specifically about this new Come Follow Me curriculum. What does the power of families say to you? What does that phrase mean when he said that? So I just want you to think about that a little bit. And if anybody has any quick thoughts, I'd be happy to hear them. What's the power of family? Please. Home is where you start from. That's where your family is. It's, it's where you come home to at night. Um, if you, I like to think it's sometimes in a work environment. We have all these different things that bring us together in these team meetings and these goals and these projects. And really, if we have that, if we can have that same thing in our family, we have the power of family. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Uh, coming home is just the highlight of my day uh, to my young kids. And uh, it, it truly, my wife and children give me the power to do what I need to do beyond. It's my sanctuary. It connects me to my Savior and to Heavenly Father. Thank you. Good. I appreciated speaking with Brother Crippen. I had not met him until a half an hour ago. We communicated very just a little bit with email and found out my niece works for him in his office here. She's a student at BYU. And he has two girls, all the rest boys, and I have two boys and all the rest girls. So we definitely have that in common too, or opposite, however you want to look at it. <laughs> so, 
Yes. <laughs> and the, I know. <laughs> we should. But um, what he has just been talking about very, very much applies to families and what we are trying to accomplish in our homes as we teach our children about service and about being like the Savior. As you read through these next few quotes, recent ones from President, uh, from President Nelson, I want you to think about the power families have to save their members and the people around them. President Nelson said this in Tahiti just barely over a month ago on his Pacific tour. There's trouble ahead. Prepare for attacks from the adversary. Please protect yourself from Satan's traps, including harmful drugs and pornography. And then in Samoa, just before that, there are difficult days ahead. Please protect your children. Help them to know the Lord and love him and keep his commandments and be free from the shackles of addiction and bondage. And then just in general conference this last April, in, in priesthood session, I should add, we need to get up off the couch, put down the remote, and wake up from our spiritual slumber. It is time to put on the full armor of God so that we can engage in the most important work on earth. It is time to thrust in our sickles and reap with all our might, mind, and strength. The forces of evil have never raged more forcefully than they do today. As servants of the Lord, we cannot be asleep while this battle rages. Your family needs your leadership and love. And then, of course, the quote from last um, October, introducing the church-supported integrated curriculum. It has the pot potential to unleash the power of families as each family follows through conscientiously and carefully to transform their home into a sanctuary of faith. I promise that as you diligently work to remodel your home into a center of gospel learning, over time your Sabbath days will be truly a delight. Your children will be excited to learn and to live the Savior's teachings, and the influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. Changes in your family will be dramatic and sustaining. Who doesn't want that? What a promise. So all of those beg the question, how do I remodel my home into a center of gospel learning and a sanctuary of faith, thus unleashing the power of my family to save God's children? So today, in the next few minutes, I have some objectives for us about family organization. We're going to learn to define family organization, identify how it can unleash the power of families and how it fits in the plan of salvation, and develop strategies that will help you organize and strengthen your family. So when I was five, I'm the oldest of 11, but when there were just three of us and I was five, my parents took us on a camping trip to Yosemite, which was close by where we lived. And during the course of that weekend, my father pulled me aside in a little personal priesthood interview and asked if I would be the missionary committee chair for our family. I had no idea what he was talking about. But he made it sound so exciting. He said, I would be in charge of helping our family set goals and be like missionaries. And I knew what missionaries were like, and I wanted to be like them. So I said yes. Turns out a little bit after that, he pulled my sister aside, who was three, and asked her if she would be the chairman of the welfare committee in our home. I'm sure she didn't know any more about welfare than I knew about missionary work. But she said yes. So the next Sunday, when we were back at home, we had our first family council. I was the missionary chair with my folder. My sister was the welfare chair with her folder. One of my parents was in charge of the genealogical and temple work committee. And one of my other parents was in charge of the home education and activities committee. And we had family council every month consistently for the rest of the years that I lived at home and even after I left for the rest of my siblings. At about the same time, we designed a family flag, and you can see the four committee areas in the home around the heart. We understood that these committee areas would help our family set goals that would bring love in our home and would help us build like the house on the rock of Christ. What I found out later, after I was five, uh, many years after I was five, was what spawned this whole family council and family organization idea. My parents had gone to state conference, an adult session, a Saturday evening session and been handed this flyer, a trifold brochure from the church with a new church-wide family initiative, family organization and records. This is the inside of it. Had an overview, objectives, and two assignments for each family. The overview said, for 1977, all families in the church are given two assignments in priesthood genealogy, one to establish a family organization and two to keep meaningful and accurate family records. And then they talked about how to do that. 
it would apply to both the immediate family, the extended family, and the ancestral family. And the immediate family was to focus on missionary work, preparedness or welfare, genealogy and temple work, and other family needs, which in my family became Home Education and Activities Committee. It would work the same for the extended family. And then in family records assignment, they were to set in order their personal and family histories and recorded testimonies and counsel and bring them up to date, as well as their four generations and general genealogy. Six months before that um, state conference happened, <coughs> And uh, the October 1976 issue of the Enzyme, you can't, it's hard to read the little sub-quote there, but it says, Family Organizations, the 20th Century Survival Kit. And there are two feature articles in there, when the Brim Halls got organized, and then an, a how-to article, Organization Begins at Home. And the sub-caption for that was, For fathers concerned about how to involve their families in missionary work, genealogy, welfare, and home education, Here's a place to start. And it gave a bit of a tutorial. A few months later, in January of 1977, there's another landmark issue of the Enzyme that focused on record keeping and family organizations. This is my first journal. That's when I got it. And I would draw a picture, and my parents would help me write. What I love about it is that the top quote right there is from President Kimball, which probably many of you have heard. He says, get a journal and write down your comings and your goings and your deepest thoughts, and maybe someday the angels will quote from it. So in all of my journals since then, I have always had that in the back of my mind because of that quote pasted on my very first journal, that this was an important record that I needed to keep. That's the cover of the enzyme. But this, just for, just for fun, is the table of contents. And if you look at these topics, family record keeping, 18 ways to record family history, writing your history, how to help your child begin a journal, the tapes they never made, how to tape record memories, this dates us, but how, six families tell how and why they organized and the new type of genealogy. This was a very, very focused magazine on family organization and record keeping. President Kimball said in his first presidency message in that enzyme, we have asked that the families of the church organize themselves to perform more efficiently their sacred missionary, welfare, home education, temple and genealogical responsibilities and to set the pattern for things to come. I love the phrase set the pattern for things to come because he talked also about changes that would be forthcoming and if we are not seeing change then I don't know what change is in the last in the few recent years. Three years after this in March we got the consolidated three-hour schedule. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember that but I do. They moved everything to one day and the purpose, according to the church, was to re-emphasize personal and family responsibility for learning, living, and teaching the gospel, and to allow church members more time for personal gospel study, for service to others, and for meaningful activities. Talks more about their objectives, and then it gives some appropriate things to do on Sunday. Most of them we know, but a couple I wanted to point out. Writing personal and family journals, holding family councils, establishing and maintaining family organizations for the immediate and extended family, and personal interviews between parents and children. That sounds familiar to what we've been hearing the last six months, doesn't it? More time on Sunday to be a family and do what's most important. So President Kimball, just before that, he said, the impression weighs upon me that the church is at a point in its growth and maturity when we are at last ready to move forward in a major way. Some decisions have been made and others pending, which will clear the way organizationally. The major strides which must be made by the church will follow upon the major strides to be made by us as individuals. I feel like with the new major strides of the church, that's a fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, the church is conforming because the members are at a point where they can do that. Only as we see clearly the responsibilities of each individual and the role of families and the home can we properly understand that the priesthood quorums and the auxiliary organizations, even wards and stakes, exist primarily to help members live the gospel in the home? So in those days, you heard about the four priesthood committees all the time, which the church then adapted into the family organization movement, missionary work, welfare, genealogy, and home teaching. And then in 1981, those kind of phased out a little bit, and President Kimball started talking about the threefold mission of the church which is what I grew up with in my teen years. Proclaim the gospel, perfect the saints, redeem the dead. But we don't hear about that very much anymore. 
Now we hear that the purpose and the mission of the church is to invite all to come unto Christ and be perfected in him. That has always been the mission of the church. It has always been the mission of families. But it's, be, but it's being stated very holistically so that we don't compartmentalize. So that said, when you look at church organization, you still see church departments that are based on family history, missionary, temple work, welfare, curriculum, and humanitarian and family services. When they set goals and move forward as a church, they still do it in certain areas. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing. These are my siblings and I. As my family grew, we started with the first four, um, those first four committees. Pretty soon, my parents didn't need to be committee chairs. They were just advisors, and all the kids were committee chairs. And then as more children came along, they added a few. So when the church consolidated to the three-hour schedule, one thing that was lost in the consolidation was for the children called Junior Sunday School. So we started having that at home. So we had a family music chairman who would teach us during Junior Sunday School a, a hymn or a, song or a primary song that we memorized. We also added a librarian at some point that took care of family records. And we added a humanitarian committee a little bit later on. So as the family expanded and evolved, so did the family organization, just as the church evolves to provide for the needs of the saints and the things that are applicable to them. President Eyring said just in April conference, building faith in Jesus Christ is the beginning of reversing spiritual decline in your family and in your home. You will best lead by example. Family members and others must see you growing in your own faith in Jesus Christ and in his gospel. You have recently been provided great help Parents in the church have been blessed with an inspired curriculum for families and individuals. As you use it, you will build your faith and the faith of your children in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe as we have an organized family structure where we set goals as a family and accomplish them in these areas and study the scriptures and this new curriculum, we can help bring our family members and those around us to Christ. So what is family organization? First, what it is not, it is not just an anthology of good practices, but it is a paradigm for achieving family goals, choosing activities, prioritizing time, and teaching children spiritual, social, and leadership skills. And it is a celestial and eternal patriarchal order designed to bring God's children to Christ. Ultimately, we are all patriarchal order, aren't we? The church is a structure designed to help us as we go to Christ, but where it all comes down to is in our homes. It's our, it's our family that will be eternal. So how can an organized family unleash the power of families? So I want you to take just a minute, now that you're in tables and no one's alone, I want you to talk to your neighbors and think about what is the benefit of being organized as you set goals as a family and try to bring your children or those around you to Christ. We'll come back together in about a minute and a half. Okay, as we're finishing our thoughts and coming back together, does anybody have a comment they would like to share about that? What's the benefit of organizing? (laughs) 
Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I love the quote that I heard of the consistency also. Elder Bednar would always talk about that. I remember, I would get frustrated as a young father, still a young father, with feeling <laughs> Talk like just a little bit louder. We're almost there. Okay, we're coming back together. Yep, please stand up. That's okay. Thank you. Then everyone can finish and listen. So I, my thought was uh, the organization, I think it's important to bring the consistency of doing it. Uh, as a young father, like especially the beginning of my family, it was frustrating when it didn't happen at the moment and the organization that we planned on. And so we've become much more flexible. And what we're organized on is the consistency of we're going to study the gospel together. And the exact time is going to be different. Like we're not going to soccer practice, but the commitment to we are going to live this gospel together has been important for us. Thank you. And I like how you mentioned that we have Elder Bednar talked about that. Consistency is key. You have to do it consistently. Any other thoughts? Yes. Thank you. Right. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, right, you'll be in trouble. I remember, I had to be, you know, in charge here. Mm. I, I remember very distinctly the moment that I thought, I'm like, I'm going to away with that one. I'm so tired. And then she came home and I was just begging for it. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm ready. I'm ready to Thank go. you. Mom, yeah. They need some structure to rely on. I agree. So I came up with a few too, just like you did. It, gave, it gives us purpose, just like you're saying. It gives kids purpose and a reason to be there and a vision of what their family is trying to accomplish. And when we stood up in family council every month and reported on our goals, we didn't always accomplish them. But we would just try again the next month, and at least every month we would revisit the thing that we knew was important for our family to do. It helps bring members in, to Christ by setting goals, so we, know, we knew what, our, what the purpose of our family was, and it helped us counsel because it brought us all together once a month in a very non-threatening way. We were just standing up, we were sharing what our goals and what we would be doing next week or next month as, as a family in that particular area of our organization. So a large part of fa effective family organization, I feel, is family councils. This is Elder Ballard, who is the LDS guru of counseling, and he said this, he said, a family council that is patterned after the councils in heaven, filled with Christ-like love and guided by the Lord's Spirit, will help us to protect our family from distractions that can steal our precious time together and protect us from the evils of the world. And I feel like that harkens back to what we just read from, from President Nelson, that the evils of the world are coming. Family councils and being a family and being organized are a way to protect against this. So... It's important to realize that the principle of organization and the principle of councils applies to everybody, but the practices and the strategies are going to be individual. So I'm hoping, my prayer today is that as you come here, you will be open to the Spirit and receive revelation for you in your particular situation. Here are some practices that my family did as I was growing up, and I was also blessed to marry a man who had had similar practices in his home and we received revelation together for our family and our family practices have evolved as we've had more kids and as we moved and circumstances have changed 
So I want you to go through some of these, and probably a lot of this is familiar. Feel free to ask if you want. But I want you to ponder, and we're going to take just a minute, what are you doing well in your family organization? What would you like to change, and how can you achieve that desired change? We're almost to the end, so I'm just going to give you about 30 seconds of silence to ponder and write that down on your paper. So there are two principles that I want you to walk away with understanding. The family is the basic and eternal unit of society and can become a great force for good when effectively organized and led. And our organized patriarchal order is a fortress for our family. We always hear in the temple when we're getting married, we're starting a kingdom. But then in the hurry and the soccer games and the dinners, we forget sometimes that this is our kingdom and we are in charge of it in, in a very much a patriarchal order. At the last conference, uh, Elder Rasband talked about how our homes are fortresses against the evils of the world. And he referred to Moroni, who fortified the Nephite cities before the Lamanites came. And even during the war, which was long and drawn out, he never stopped fortifying. He always kept building. And Elder Rasband reiterates that some things can be overwhelming, but we build a log at a time. We start a piece at a time with our families, with the things that we need most. Here are some resources, but I just, as I close, want to bear you my testimony of family and of organizational families, of the, of the power that can come when we set up our family organization and strive for goals, because that is how we bring people to Christ. The structure and the, will not save us, but the structure gives us a way to focus on the Savior and what is the most important in our family. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.